So the um, next presentation is in some common um, gynecological presentations in general. <laughs> going to look at bleeding in early pregnancy, which as you, can, as you can appreciate is quite a common problem. Then we're going to look at heavy periods. And then we're going to look at acute abdomen uh, uh, presentation with acute abdomen to gynecology and just to just guide you through the kind of things we'll think about. So uh, just go straight through to bleeding in early pregnancy. It's a very common problem and a source of great anxiety for many patients. I imagine you've watched loads of movies where people have bled and they've used that to indicate that there's been a miscarriage or something bad's happened to a pregnancy. So it's, um, it's a very important uh, problem and it's... Because it's so important and so common, it can easily come up in your OSCEs. And so having an approach to how you'd assess a patient or having some um, simple but important differential diagnosis in mind, uh, I'd say is really important for you to know about obstetrics. Um, and so we'll just look at um, the important causes, which are miscarriage, which is any pregnancy loss um, less than 24 weeks gestation is the official definition for miscarriage. Um, ectopic pregnancy is any pregnancy that is not implanted correctly in the womb. Um, common definition is outside the womb, but we know that we have cervical ectopics now and cesarean scar ectopics. So that's why I've chosen to say any pregnancy that's not implanted correctly in the womb um, is an ectopic pregnancy, but it's most commonly cited in the fallopian tubes over 95% of the time. Okay. Uh, Motor pregnancies um, is... The, the official name for motor pregnancy is gestation, gestational trophoblastic disease. Um, and that's just um, an abnormal kind of pregnancy. And I think it's linked to pregnancy because beta HCG is positive. Okay. But it's when there's two different kinds. You have a partial molar pregnancy or a complete molar pregnancy. Um, in a complete molar pregnancy, it's usually one empty egg fertilized by, by two sperm. So you have two copies of the genetic material or in a partial molar, you have one empty egg, um, I mean, one egg with a haploid um, uh, genetic material, and then you have two sperm. So you then have three times the genetic material in there. And that's how you get this abnormal pregnancy that isn't compatible with life. Um, and so then they have problems like bleeding in pregnancy, hyperemesis, or the uterus is large for date. And so that's, that's, a, that's another um, condition in pregnancy that's important to know. And then it could just be an implantation bleed, or it could be local causes, like we discussed, things like cervical atropion, cervical cancer, or it could be something completely random, like a Bartholin cyst that just happened to cause a bit of bleeding as well. Um, a Bartholin cyst, if you imagine, like, just in terms of anatomy, the clitoris as midnight, it will be a cyst that develops at five and seven o'clock in terms of the clock face. Um, and it's usually from inside the vagina in the Bartholin's gland. They get infected and they swell and they cause like a, a big swelling. And that can happen in pregnancy as well. And so if they if they pop and they're discharging, they can be bloodstained discharge. And that could be a cause of bleeding in early pregnancy as well. Um, so assessment of bleeding in early pregnancy, you need to take your history. Um, you need to take... Um, so you need to take your full gynecological history. Um, and when I say gynecological history, I'm talking about things like um, the first day of the last period, cervical smear, contraception, um, any history of bleeding in between periods or following intercourse. Um, you know, is there any chance you could be pregnant? Things like that, history of STLs, PIDs, those kind of things. You need to take a full gyne history. Uh, but the specific things that I want to point out here are the date of the last menstrual period. If it's more than four weeks, there's a chance she could be pregnant. So either ask her if she's done a pregnancy test or make a mental note that you would do a pregnancy test later. OK, and then you need to quantify the bleeding. Is it a little bit of spotting or is she soaking more than one pad an hour? So you need to quantify the bleeding to just help you gauge what the, what the, what problem is more likely. And then. Is it associated with pain? And then if it, if it is, do your Socrates. And the red flag things you're looking for in bleeding in early pregnancy is shoulder tip pain or collapse. If she, just, if she has it in her history that, oh, that she's fainted in the last day or so, um, it's an important red flag symptom because a lot of um, young women have um, incredible um, capacity to compensate. So they'll compensate hemodynamically for the fact that they're bleeding internally. And so they could have 1.5 liters of blood in their abdomen, but sitting there upright talking to you. And so they can just suddenly be all the way fine and then drop. And so history of collapse could suggest that there might be significant bleed going on. So um, it's an important one to, to know, feeling faint. 
Um, and then you need to ask specifically if someone's bleeding in early pregnancy about risk factors for an ectopic pregnancy. So the classic one that a lot of students like is previous ectopic, and that's true um, because um, one of the things that damages um, the tube beforehand could have damaged the other tube. Um, and so that could result in an ectopic pregnancy. Things like IUD, so that's an intrauterine device. It doesn't overall increase the risk of ectopic because actually failure, um, the it's 99% sure to work. So it's a 1% failure rate with the intrauterine device. So if she gets pregnant on it, then the risk of an ectopic is higher. So the overall probability of her getting pregnant with an intrauterine contraceptive device is lower, uh, but if she does get pregnant, the risk of ectopic is higher. Previous history of um, pelvic inflammatory disease or sexually transmitted infection um, can increase your risk of ectopic because it can cause um, damage to the tubes. So things like chlamydia can cause damage to the tubes. And if you had like a significant PID that spilled into, passed into your pelvis, um, then it can increase the risk of adhesions forming, which can then affect motility within the tubes and cause ectopic pregnancy. In the same vein, if you have um, severe endometriosis or history of previous um, ruptured appendix, that could spill things into the pelvis or you could get adhesions um, following that. And so that can increase your risk of ectopic. So the risk factors, you want to quickly whiz through them. So have you ever had a previous ectopic? What are you using for contraception? Any previous pelvic infections? Um, and like his, and the rest of her medical history should can point to risk factors. Okay, and then you take the rest of her gynae and obstetric history and then the rest of the medical and surgical history, especially abdominal surgery. Okay, so those are the kind of things you want to elicit if someone's had bleeding in pregnancy. So then what would you do in assessment? Again, if a patient looks unwell, then you've got to assess their A, B, C, D, E approach. Okay, and just follow that systematically. It won't fail you. Um, and just as a tip for when you become F1s, if you ever call to see an unwell patient, just assess her, go through your A, B, C, D, E, and you, you will do a thorough assessment if you do your A to E, uh, and then you should hopefully pick up what's going on before you, your seniors arrive. Um, and then um, you do an abdominal examination. So here, your, compared to your, like, your abdominal examination, say in liver, um, this is more of a surgical abdominal examination. So you'd be looking for tenderness, guarding, any signs of rigidity. Can you feel the uterus from the abdomen? Because sometimes a woman thinks she's six weeks pregnant, but you can feel her uterus and it feels more like 16 weeks. And so sometimes women can get the dates wrong. So you want to palpate that. Uh, and then your speculum examination, you're checking for bleed. Um, and you're also checking for the cervical os or whether you can see any pregnancy tissue in the vagina or in the cervix, um, which will become important when we discuss um, a little bit later. And then your bimanual palpation, you're looking for the size of the uterus. And then you're also looking at the adnexa, looking for um, any tenderness um, or any cervical motion tenderness, which could suggest an ectopic. Um, cervical motion tenderness or cervical excitation, what, um, is, um, is an important symptom because if you move the cervix, you move the uterus and you move the adnexus. So if she's got an adnexal mass, so whether, whether it is from an ectopic pregnancy um, or whether it is from like a pelvic infection, it suggests um, it, the cervical excitation will be positive. So those are the kind of things you want to be articulating to your examiner when you're saying, I'll do an examina abdominal examination because um, I'm looking for signs of tenderness um, that could suggest an ectopic pregnancy. And if it's more central, um, it could suggest um, it's a miscarriage um, as well. If it's central and it's a cramping pain, it could suggest um, a miscarriage over an ectopic. Um, and then we talked about your bimanual palpation. So then what would you do in terms of your investigations? So never forget your pregnancy test in any woman with bleeding. Um, so do a urinary pregnancy test and then do a general urinalysis because she could just have abdo pain because she's got a UTI. Um, and then you do your blood, full blood count, group and save. Um, do a cross match if she's bleeding heavily um, and then use an ears as well if she's bleeding heavily. I've put beta HCG and progesterone in the bracket because they're important tests in early pregnancy, but we would only use them following a scan to help us determine management. Um, and I'll go in, into that a little bit more later. And then the imaging form you would use would be a transvaginal pelvic ultrasound, except for some reason it's really unacceptable to the woman, then you, you'd go for um, a transabdominal ultrasound, but ideally transvaginal is better because you get better images in early pregnancy. If I could just pause because I can see a question. Ah, so 
Michael excitation. So someone's asked for me to go through it again. So when you have, to, so what you do to elicit cervical excitation is you do a vaginal examination. So two gloved fingers in, into the uh, into the vagina with some jelly on it. And what you do is you move the cervix from side to side. And what you're trying to uh, what you're trying to do is elicit pain in her abdomen. It's generally generally quite uncomfortable to have a vaginal examination and someone move their fingers. Um, and so usually you ask the patient the question, Can you, are you getting any pain in your abdomen? And when you're moving the cervix, it's because it's attached to the uterus, you move the uterus. And because the fallopian tubes and ovaries are attached to the uterus, you also move that. So if there's an adnexal mass, like from an ectopic pregnancy or in PID from a tubal variant abscess, then moving the cervix around will move the adnexa as well. And if there's a mass or a problem with it, then it will cause discomfort in the abdomen. And that's the, the explanation for why cervical excitation is an important sign to elicit. Um, and so, yeah, we've talked about the investigations that we would do. And then the management plan would be determined by what you think is going on. So as a general rule, when we assess, we, we don't know what's going on, but you, it's, I always say this, any pregnant woman in early pregnancy who you've not done a scan on, on before, she's an ectopic until proven otherwise if she's presented with pain. So abdominal pain in early pregnancy, no previous scan is an ectopic until proven otherwise. So that's the chief thing that you want to rule out. Obviously, if you do an examination and you're quite sure you see a sac, you're quite sure you've taken out pregnancy tissue, then it's most likely an ectopic, but otherwise you suspect it's an ectopic pre pregnancy and you manage as such. So if she's in a lot of pain um, and you think she, she's an ectopic pregnancy, then I always suggest you keep her nil by mouth at the very least till your seniors review. Okay. Um, sometimes you can say, or oh, just drink clear water only, uh, because in terms of fasting rules for going to theatre, you can have clear water up until two hours before you go to theatre or um, any food up until six hours to prevent the risks, to reduce the risk of um, aspiration. And so it's important to know fasting rules. That's why when you assess anyone, whether it's in general surgery with a suspected um, appendicitis or whatever, you would keep them nil by mouth till they see your seniors just so that you don't delay them going into theatre. Um, let me just have a look. There's another question. just the comment. Um, uh, so if it's an ectopic pregnancy and she's coming in severe pain or she's hemodynamically unstable, then your management plan will be surgical, which is a laparoscopic salpingectomy, which is to remove the fallopian tube that's affected, or a salpingotomy, which is when you open, do an incision in the fallopian tube and just scoop out the ectopic. That's not a common procedure. And the reason being is there's a high chance you would leave pregnancy tissue behind. And so the lady will require additional follow-up and you're leaving a damaged fallopian tube behind. The reason why um, um, doing a salpingotomy is an option is because say a lady's had a previous ectopic pregnancy and has lost the other tube or, at, uh, or when you want to do the salpingectomy, you realize the other tube looks abnormal, then you can Offer that you can do a salpingotomy um, to try and save her a tube because if she loses both of her fallopian tubes, she needs IVF to get pregnant um, in the future. And so, but surgical management will be the most appropriate thing if you suspect she's hemodynamically unstable or she's in significant pain because it rules out medical or conservative management. But if a lady is not in pain, she's hemodynamically stable, only having a bit of bleeding, then conservative management or expectant management might be suitable. So conservative management just means we actually do nothing and we just monitor the lady closely. And you can do that for an, for an ectopic pregnancy, but they need to meet specific criteria. This is where the beta HCG helps. Okay, because depending on the beta HCG levels, um, there's strict, nice guideline criteria that every unit can follow. Uh, but if it's usually as a general, rule, it needs to be less than 1,500. It needs to be dropping on its own um, for you to say expectant management is suitable. Other than that, then you can use medical management. Again, they can't be in pain. Um, there's specific criteria in terms of the size of the um, adnexal mass or the size of the ectopic. It can't be a live ectopic, ectopic meaning the baby has a heartbeat um, in the ectopic pregnancy. So there's strict criteria. And if that criteria is met, um, then you can also offer methotrexate. Um, methotrexate, uh, it also has to be acceptable to the woman that she needs to come back for multiple blood tests of beta-HCG and she can't get pregnant for about 12 weeks because 
Methotrexate is an antifolate. And remember, we give pregnant women folic acid in pregnancy to prevent neural tube defects. So if you then give uh, methotrexate to manage an ectopic, um, then you need to tell the woman she can't get pregnant for three months or 12 weeks. Okay. So those are the management options for your ectopic pregnancy. For miscarriage, um, you've got conservative medical and surgical options. Um, for the, uh, so just see if there's a, I think there's a question. Ah, so I'll answer that in a second. So um, for conservative management, it just means you do nothing and you can give the woman up until two weeks. Um, you give her information and you tell her what to expect in terms of the bleeding um, in that she will bleed a lot. She might pass pregnancy tissue. You safety net, tell her if she bleeds and she's soaking more than one pad in an hour, she needs to come into a &E, so you need to see her. So that's your conservative management. It just means you do nothing. You wait for the body to do to expel the pregnancy naturally. And, and that and that works for a lot of women. But to expedite the process, you can offer the lady medical management. And you can do that with misoprostol. Now, you give mifepristone if the pregnancy is greater than 12 weeks and it's a missed miscarriage. And we'll come on to that in, in a minute. And there was a trial called Mifimiso trial that found that that's more effective um, than just giving misoprostol alone. So, yes, you give the misoprostol, uh, mifepristone first and then you give misoprostol subsequently. Um, you give mifepristone, wait 24 to 48 hours um, and then you give misoprostol. Okay. And then there's also surgical management, which is a uh, surgical evacuation um, of the uterus. So someone's just asked the question. Beta HCG, where does it come from? And why is it a marker of pregnancy? So the beta HCG is created by the placenta. So initially when a woman gets pregnant, the pregnancy is maintained by the corpus luteum and the progesterone that's produced by the corpus luteum, which is the leftover from the ovulation that gets maintained in the menstrual cycle. But the beta HCG then get, gets produced by the placenta and then takes over, as well as the other hormones in pregnancy, the maintenance of the pregnancy. So it's released by the placenta. Um, I think that's just something else. Um, and then the surgical management. So the way I think I describe surgical management to those who haven't seen it before is if you take a large straw, you can think of a large straw, but it's got like a, it's not got a sharp end. Um, it, we use, it's called a suction curette is the proper name for it. And we put that into the uterus um, after gently dilating the cervix. And then you attach a vacuum to it. Um, and that the vacuum then progressively empties the uterus. So you just rotate the suction curette round and the negative pressure empties the uterus. Okay, and that's how you do a surgical management of miscarriage. It can be done under local anesthetic and you, the procedure is then usually called a manual vacuum aspiration. Um, and it, you can look, you can Google the kits online. Um, it's all handheld. You don't need um, an electricity generated suction. It's all handheld generated suction that you use. Um, and um, or you can do it uh, under general anesthetic. And then mode pregnancy, as I've described it earlier, usually you, we prefer surgical management of miscarriage. There's a high risk of bleeding with uh, mode pregnancies. But then you send the pregnancy tissue off um, for histology because it needs to be histologically confirmed. And once it's histologically confirmed, it needs to be registered with the gestational disease uh, trophoblastic center because of the risk of choriocarcinoma. That's why it's important because we need to monitor these ladies till their beta HCG is negative. Um, there's a spectrum of diseases and you can look out. That's outside the remit of what I think you'd be expected to know as medical students. But um, the, the main thing you need to understand about it is it's not a pregnancy that's compatible with life. Um, you need to end pregnancy by doing the surgical management. You need to then register the pregnancy at a gestational disease trophoblastic, uh, gestational disease, uh, trophoblastic center, um, usually in Sheffield or Charing Cross. Um, and then they follow up the lady till her beta HCG is negative. Um, I think that's it for bleeding in early pregnancy. I've got a little task for you if my slides will move forward. So I need you to match um, these presentations. So there's a lot of terminology around miscarriage, uh, so incomplete, complete, threatened, missed. Um, so many different terminologies. So it's important for you to be clear on what they mean. And so I've designed this task to just sort of emphasize that. Um, so we'll just go through slide by slide and just going through what each of them, what the definition will be by that description. 
So I've just gone to it. So this first lady is 28 years old, gravid one para knot. She went for her dating scan at 12 weeks and four days by LMP. And sadly, the scan showed that there was no fetal heartbeat and the fetus measured approximately eight weeks. So what definition do you think will tag with this one? Of all four. Okay, so I'm just going to um, review the answers now. I'll give it a few more seconds. So, yeah. So by definition, I know I haven't gone through this with you guys just because of time. That's why I decided to go through it with this um, task. So this is a missed miscarriage. And the reason why we would call it a missed miscarriage is because she had no symptoms. She just went for a routine scan. And that's when they've picked up that she's had a miscarriage. An incomplete miscarriage will come to in a second. So I'll talk to you about it a little bit more. And a threatened miscarriage, she's not reached the definition um, and it's not threatened anymore because we've confirmed that it's a miscarriage. So it's no longer a threat. Um, um, but we'll go through it in the subsequent slides. So hopefully it becomes clear by the time we've done all four of them. So this next lady is 40 years old. She's grabbed a three para two, attended an early pregnancy unit with some vaginal spotting, on examination, the cervix was closed and the scan showed a viable pregnancy. So which one do you think this might be? Give you guys a few more seconds. So threatened, yes. So the difference here, so the correct answer is threatened miscarriage. So the difference here is she's had a bleed, the cervix is closed, and the scan shows it's a viable pregnancy. So it's a threat of a miscarriage, but the pregnancy is actually fine at the moment. Okay, so that's what a threat in miscarriage is. Okay, so any woman that has a bleed in early pregnancy and has still has a viable pregnancy, it's classed as a threat in miscarriage, um, except she meets the condition of the other definitions which we're going through at the moment. So this next one is gravida five power four, attended with a second episode of vaginal bleeding to the early pregnancy unit. The bleeding got heavier today. She had a previous scan that showed a viable pregnancy, but the scan today shows absolutely no pregnancy. So which one's this one? Okay, so I'm just gonna reveal the answer. Yeah, so you guys have gone for complete miscarriage. Majority of you have gone for that, and that's correct. Um, it's not an incomplete miscarriage because of the information I gave you saying she had she had a scan that showed that there's no pregnancy, or you might say things like the uterus is empty with no evidence of retained products of conception. Um, and the important key thing that I've given you here is that she had a previous scan that showed a viable pregnancy. Now, if this lady didn't have a previous scan that showed a pregnancy and she had a scan that showed nothing, but her pregnancy test was positive, this would actually be a pregnancy of unknown location. So the key thing that I've given you in this scenario that is important to emphasize is that she had a previous scan that showed a viable pregnancy. And now there's absolutely no pregnancy in the uterus. And the history says the bleeding got heavier. So that's that's what's giving you the clue um, to that. Um, oh, sorry. And then the next one is uh, 20 years old, grabbed a two para one, presented with heavy bleeding at eight weeks by LMP and some products of conception were seen on speculum, but the cervix is still open. I'm just gonna show the answers here. So incomplete miscarriage. And everyone's gotten the correct answer. And that's perfect. It's just there is some evidence that some of the pregnancy tissue has come away, um, but there's still um, tissue uh, in the cervix. There's another one that I, I haven't put in the quiz. And it's called inevitable miscarriage. That's when you assess someone. It doesn't matter if the scan shows a viable pregnancy, but you assess them and they're bleeding heavily and their cervix is open. Um, that's an inevitable miscarriage because the cervix is already open. OK, it doesn't matter whether you can see pregnancy tissue or not, but you can see that there's heavy bleeding and the cervix is open. Sometimes you can see the preg a little bit of the pregnancy sac. Um, it's called an inevitable miscarriage. And sometimes, sadly, on the scan, you can still see the baby's heart is still beating. But unfortunately, um, it's still um, a miscarriage.
Okay. Any questions on Miss Garage before we move? And I think that might be the last slide on Miss Garage. I mean, on bleeding in pregnancy. Sorry. There's no okay, and I've just put there. okay, and I've just put this slide there. Just again, just the correct matches. So now we move to the next kind of bleeding, uh, which is heavy periods or menorrhagia. So um, it's a very common problem, um, and the definition is uh, subjective. Gone are the days where we used to say eight mils, eighty mils per period was heavy. Um, it's just it's subjective and how it's impacting the woman's quality of life. So that's why it's an important um, topic. Um, in terms of causes, most of you would have come across um, this mnemonic palm coin. Um, and it's just a list of causes of abnormal uterine bleeding. And it's, uh, it's the FIGO classification. That's a European international um, um, body, that gynecological body. Um, so um, the... Palm refers to the structural causes and Cohen refers to the non-structural causes. So in terms of heavy bleeding, things like polyps, adenomyosis, um, polyps are like skin tags um, in the uterus and the cervix. Um, those are polyps. Um, adenomyosis refers to when you get ectopic endometrial tissue in the myometrium. Okay. Um, and that's different from endometriosis, which is when you get ectopic endometrial tissue elsewhere. Outside, outside the endometrial lining. Um, but adenomyosis can cause heavy and painful periods. Um, leomyoma um, is, uh, the, is the um, official word for fibro uterine fibroids. Um, it's just the medical word for it, um, uterine fibroids. Fibroids are really common. Up, up to 40 to 50% of the population will have fibroids. Um, it's increased in uh, women of um, Afro-Caribbean ethnicity or Asian ethnicity, more likely to have fibroids. Um, malignancy, um, any cancer of any part of the uterine system, um, uh, of the gynecological tract um, can cause bleeding. And then the non-structural things like coagulopathy, hopefully they would have picked that up in childhood. Um, you can get really, really heavy bleeding in ladies with uh, polycystic ovarian sy syndrome because they have really infrequent periods. And so they bleed heavier when they do have a period. Um, and copper IEDs can increase the risk of um, bleeding as well. Okay. And say if you have like endometrial hyperplasia, for instance, that can cause abnormal bleeding as well. And sometimes we can't find a cause. A lady just has heavy bleeding, but there's no cause that you can find. Okay. So how would you go around assessing a lady? Usually these ladies will present to gynecological clinic. Occasionally they pre present to A&E, um, and on call. So I'm going to approach this from where they most commonly present, which is um, gynecological clinic. Okay. And so you're trying to quantify the bleed. Uh, sometimes you ask them how many pads or tampons or whether they have to use double protection. If there's any soiling. It, um, I met a lady recently who has had to change her mattress um, because of heavy menstrual bleeding. Um, and so those kind of things you want to establish to just help you gauge how this is affecting her quality of life, how much sanitary products she's having to go through. And then you want to know, is it associated with any, any pain? Is it cyclical pain, like it's just during the periods um, in that it's crampy pain when she's bleeding heavily and then she doesn't have any pain? Or is it more that actually she gets a warning like three days beforehand that she's going to she, she's going to get severe pain in her pelvis? And that then eases during the period, which could suggest something like um, endometriosis because they get the pain even before the bleeding starts. And then usually the pain um, classically stops within a few days of the period and then comes again the next period. That will be your classic um, cyclical endometriosis type pain, whereas you can get painful periods um, that's just associated with the days where you're bleeding heavily. Um, dyspareunia is pain during intercourse, dysuria is pain on urination, and dyskesia is pain on opening bowels. And those will point towards more like an endometriosis type picture, but you might have endometriosis and heavy menstrual bleeding. Um, endometriosis by itself does not necessarily cause um, heavy menstrual bleeding. And then you want to get your classic gynecological history. You want to know about the cycles. Um, Things like intermenstrual bleeding or postcoital bleeding could point to things like a polyps or something going on with the endometrium. That's why she's getting intermenstrual bleeding and postcoital bleeding. And NICE actually suggests you do certain investigations first, which will come on to if they've got intermenstrual bleeding, um, because it's most likely to be uh, um, 
they suggest hysteroscopy because it's most likely going to be an uh, endometrial problem if they have significant intermenstrual bleeding. Um, and I've talked about painful periods. Um, you ask about cervical smears, what contraception they're on because it will have an impact on the management and if they've had any PID or SDIs just as a way of completing your history. Um, you need to ask about whether or not their family is complete because that will affect your management plan. Um, and what you can offer them. You also want to know what she's tried because there's nothing more frustrating for a woman than you offering her management she's already had and didn't work. And then you want to gauge the obstetric history and then the rest of the medical and surgical history. Remember, gynecology is also a part surgical. It's a surgical specialty. So we want to know if she's had any abdominal surgery, whether she's had any complications with anesthetic before. And the medical history will be relevant from the point of view of um, is she, is she fit and well to undergo surgery or does she have a lot of comorbidities where surgery is not even a suitable option for her? So those are the kind of things you'd be thinking about and asking about when you're trying to um, take a history from someone with menorrhagia. And then when you examine them, so note, if you're seeing her in an A&E type setting, you need to do observations, make sure she's hemodynamically stable. But I'm presenting this as like a clinic setting thing. Um, so in the abdominal examination, you want to see, can I feel a palpable mass that could suggest a fibroid? Um, speculum examination, you're looking for things like cervical ectropion. Can you see a polyp protruding from the cervix? Um, is there any evidence of malignancy? Does the, you know, does the cervix look abnormal? Is there anything that you can see on speculum examination that suggests a malignancy? And then your bimanual palpation will be for you to assess for the size and mobility of the uterus. So with adenomyosis, for instance, the uterus will be more bulky. It could also be tender um, when you palpate it. And then you can also gauge if there are any fibroids or anything else going on there. And then BMI is also important from a surgical perspective. And also some of the medication options might be restricted in some ladies with raised BMI. And then your investigations, again, I've ordered a bedside blood imaging, that kind of thing. Uh, do a urine pregnancy test because any change or change to a woman's bleeding, you need to make sure she's not pregnant. Uh, and then do a urinalysis as well. Um, the main blood test you need for menorrhagia is FBC. Um, that's what the senior gynecologists will say. Uh, but traditionally, we used to do TFTs, uh, thyroid function tests, if she had symptoms of hypothyroidism that could cause heavy bleeding and we used to do clotting screen um, but as a general rule we wouldn't do that routinely anymore we'll just do a full blood count um, imaging wise pelvic ultrasound is your mainstay of imaging um, to just rule out things like fibroids or any other cause um, or polyps that they can see on scan and then hysteroscopy as i said earlier if there's intermenstrual bleeding or you're susp suspecting polyps and things like that you do a hysteroscopy. And what a hysteroscopy is, for those of you that haven't done your obs on gyne rotations yet or haven't come across it, is essentially a camera that is a camera that goes into the uterus via the vagina. And it's on it's a long um, camera. It's on a long um, sort of rod, uh, but it's really thin, thinner than the sort of the tip of the pen. Um, and that goes in and uses water. And so we always tell the patients it's going to be cold and wet. It goes through the cervix, fills the uterus with water, um, because normally the uterus, the walls of the uterus will be compressed on each other. But when you go in with the hysteroscope, you fill it with water so you can actually see the uterine walls and visualize if there's any polyps or does the endometrium look normal. And you can then obtain directed endometrial biopsies or you can remove polyps and things like that um, if you want to add hysteroscopy. Um, and MRI pelvis is not routine, but we'd use it for fibroid mapping or if the ultrasound is not getting adequate images, then we might need to use an MRI pelvis. And then I've just put management. Before I go into management, are there any questions? You can put it in the chat or anything if you want to. Um, but I'll just wish through because of time, I'm um, just aware. Um, but management depends on what you think the cause is. But as a general rule, um, if you're trying to keep it con um, structured, conservative management, um, diet, exercise, weight loss is always helpful. Um, in ladies who have high BMI, higher BMI, you get peripheral conversion of adipose tissue uh, to sort of um, estrogens. And that estrogen can stimulate the endometrium and increase the risk of heavy bleeding and increase risk of things like endometrial hyperplasia and actually endometrial cancer. So weight loss um, through diet and exercise is, is a viable option for the treatment of um, menorrhagia. 
And then the medical options are split into into, um, hormonal and non-hormonal. Some women, hormonal treatments are completely unacceptable to them. And so you you need to have non-hormonal options. And the options we have are tranexamic acid. And if she's not asthmatic, um, then um, NSAIDs like methanemic acids, the most common one we use, but ibuprofen also works if she can't get access to methanemic acid. Um, And then in terms of hormonal options, first line would be your Mirena coil or because Mirena has lost its like um, exclusivity license, you, I would suggest you say levonorgestrel intrauterine system. Make sure you say intrauterine system because intrauterine devices refer to the copper coils and they cause menorrhagia. So you want to say intrauterine system at the very least, but say levonorgestrel intrauterine system and you can say like the Mirena coil or they've got like JDES and other brand names, um, but the proper thing to say now is levonorgestrel and treatment system. Um, in terms of oral alternatives, you can use the combined oral contraceptive pill, um, and you really need to check for contraindications to this. To this, um, Just to signpost you to where you can look that up, it's a UK medical eligibility criteria, so we call it UK MEC, and you can download a PDF document that has all the contraindications to different contra um, contraceptives, so it's worth checking that. Um, and then you can use cyclical oral progesterone. So things like norethisterone or things like uh, progesterone only pills, you can start ladies on to manage their periods. Um, the last two are not as common um, and they'll probably be started by um, gynecologists. Ulipristal acetate, some of you would recognize as a form of emergency contraceptive, but they use it in women to treat fibroids if they're unsuitable for surgery or uterine artery embolization. And gonadotrophin releasing hormone analogs are also used in women with fibroids um, as a bridge to surgery. And um, they give it to them to try and shrink the fibroids and it will create a menopause type state. Um, so they're not the most commonly used first line things, but they're management options and they're hormonal. And then we'll just go finally to the surgical options for the management of menorrhagia. So if there's a polyp, you remove it at hysteroscopy or some mucous fibroids, you can remove at hysteroscopy. Endometrial ablation, if their family is complete, you're just uh, burning the lining of the womb. Uterine artery embolization, you're blocking the blood supply to the uterus and to the fibroids. um, And that will cause shrinkage of the fibroids and you can retain fertility with that. Myomectomy is just to remove the fibroids and you leave the uterus behind. So that retains fertility as well. And hysterectomy does not retain fertility. It's if the family is complete, you can offer that as an option. And it's major surgery. So you have to counsel women about that. And I said you can pre-treat with the gonadotrophin releasing hormone to shrink the fibroids um, before a hysterectomy or myomectomy. Okay. I think that's it for menorrhagia. I've just got two, one or two questions just to emphasize one or two points before we move on to the final thing. So uh, you've got a lady 36 weeks, she's para two, heavy menstrual bleeding, uh, but not painful periods. Her BMI is 38, she smokes 20 cigarettes per day. What would be, uh, what, and she's not keen on trying to coil. So what would be the most suitable options man- of management for her? If we just, um, Okay, I'll just go ahead and reveal the answers on this one just so we can chop through it. So I've put a bit of information in there to just help you with your decision in terms of choosing the answer. So the people who have chosen the option of um, Cerazet would be correct. So Cerazet is a progesterone-only pill. And the reason why I suggest that over the combined oral contraceptive pill is because this lady has got a BMI of 38 and she smokes 20 cigarettes per day. Okay, and she's 36 years old. So once you read that um, eligibility criteria that I was telling you about, you see that the microgynin, a combined oral contraceptive pill, is contraindicated. Okay, Um, the methanemic acid is is primarily to help with pain, and her periods aren't painful. Okay, and that's why um, I would suggest. uh, the progesterone only pill is best. Now, having said that, methanemic acid and tranexamic acid together have a synergistic effect of reducing menstrual flow. 
So strictly speaking, you can use methanemic acid with TXA to achieve a reduction in menstrual flow. But methanemic acid on its own versus a progesterone only pill, you'd go for a progesterone only pill. And then let's just move on. And then this is the final section. Um, I think I'm running behind on time. So I just need to try and wish through um, just um, to just get you guys an idea of some of what you could come across as an acute abdomen. Um, so we've dealt with bleeding in pregnancy, which deals with a lot of the early pregnancy problems that could present with pain anyways. Uh, but this in this section of the talk, I'm just talking about non-pregnancy um, uh, abdominal pain. And the key causes that I think you need to be aware of is pelvic inflammatory disease, um, ovarian or adnexal torsion, Middle smirks, which is like just mid-cycle pain, so roughly around ovulation. And then think non-gynecological causes like appendicitis. And then you can get acute on chronic pelvic pain. So ladies with history of endometriosis um, that come in with like just an acute episode of pain. And then it could also be things like painful periods from things like adenomyosis. So there's some important differentials depending on the history that you get. Okay, and I'm just going to wish through this slides, but... Socrates is really important. Um, site matters. So if I get referred a patient who's got a negative pregnancy test but has uh, right elect fossa pain, I'd want the a &E doctors to speak to surgeons about excluding appendicitis before referring her for, as a gynae pathology, for instance. Um, is there any associated bleeding? Is there any unusual vaginal discharge? Is there fever associated? Like what else is going on with this pain that she's presented with? So approach it like you would, you would like a surgical history. Um, and then do your full gynecological history. Has she had any recent gynecological procedures? For instance, did she have a coil put in recently or has she just been to hysteroscopy or has something happened recently gynecologically? That might give you clues as to why she has abdominal pain. And then you just take the rest of the history. Um, with your examination, similar to what you do with the early pregnancy ones, you're looking for tenderness, guarding. So you're looking for acute abdominal signs um, that this is a surgical abdomen, that this is peritonitis. So you're looking for things like that. Observations will tell you whether she's hemodynamically stable or not. On speculum, you can see if there's bleeding, is there discharge? If there's a significant discharge or she's got, um, she has, high, she's high risk, then I'll do what we call, uh, I'll do swabs to screen for STIs. And most units now, I think you just do two swabs. You don't do triple swabs anymore. And one is an endocervical swab, which is sent for nucleic acid amplification tests for chlamydia and gonorrhea. And then you do a high vaginal swab to test for things like trichomoniasis, thrush, bacterial vaginosis, things like that. You would be able to test with a high vaginal swab, whereas you need a nucleic acid amplification test to test for chlamydia and gonorrhea. Um, you can also you also have the option of doing a uh, endocervical normal MCNS swab or like an endocervical one to test for um for gonorrhea as well. Um, so you can do that on your on your speculum examination, and then your bimanual palpation will be looking for um masses, tenderness, cervical excitation, as I've explained earlier. Um, investigations you're doing a urinalysis for pregnancy tests and checking for UTIs or any other complication. Um, you'd be screening for infections. So you'd be doing FBC using ECRPs, you'd be doing LFPs, and you'd be doing group and save just in case. And you might need to end up in theatre if you think it's an acute abdomen. Um, and your imaging of choice will be a pelvic ultrasound. Um, and then the management options you have depends on what the cause is. So for instance, if you think it's an ovarian torsion, that causes severe pain, like really, really severe, like renal colic level pain. Um, and you need to have a high index of suspicion for it to be able to diagnose it. You don't diagnose ovarian torsion on an ultrasound scan. You diagnose it clinically. So if the symptoms are severe enough, she's needing opiate analgesia, it's not settling the pain, um, then you might need to take her to theatre and do a diagnostic laparoscopy um, over doing just an ultrasound scan because an ultrasound scan cannot rule out an ovarian torsion. Um, so you do laparoscopy plus or minus, removing just the cyst if there's a cyst there, or sometimes there's gang there's gangrene and there's necrosis. So you have to do an oophorectomy and sometimes they, and they might lose a tube as well. So you might need to do a self-injectomy. If it's PID, you treat it empirically. 
Um, if it's just mitral smirks, endometriosis, adenomyosis, you give analgesia. And if it's append appendicitis or you're suspecting a surgical cause, you get surgical review. The key thing with acute abdomen is if you're unsure um, that whether she'll need surgery or not, just keep her nearby mouth till senior review. Think about whether you need to resuscitate her. So think about whether she needs IV fluids. Um, think about what analgesia she needs and just prescribe her analgesia according to the WHO pain ladder um, and just make sure that you're getting her comfortable um, as possible whilst you're waiting for senior review. If she's pyrexial, tachycardic, things like that, then do your septic screen and don't forget lactate and do your venous gas and checking for lactate and things like that. So I just got um, um, the same case just to illustrate a point, just asking you different questions about it. So you've got a uh, 23 years old, Paranot, um, attended A&E with severe left eyelet fossa pain, associated with vomiting and a fever. She's noticed a change to her vaginal discharge in the last two days. She takes the combined oral contraceptive pill to regulate her periods and has no regular sexual partner. She's normally fit and well, opens her bowels once a day and has no urinary symptoms. So what do we think um, the likely diagnosis from this history is? Okay, I'm just going to reveal the answers uh, now. So this uh, lady, the reason, um, the correct answer that I've chosen is chlamydia. And I'll explain to you why I've put some risk factors in there for you um, to help you see why it's most likely chlamydia. So the first thing I said in there is she's noticed a change to her vaginal discharge. She's not, she doesn't, she doesn't have a regular partner. So chances are she's not, because she's on a combined oral contraceptive, she's not using barrier um, contraception. Um, I'm glad none of you chose diverticulitis because she's a 23 year old, 23 years old and her bowels are normal and she has no urinary symptoms. So the two possible strong things it could be, and she's got left toilet fossa pain. So except she has situs inversus, is not as likely. I, I would never say never, but it's not as likely. So the two options we have is the ovarian cyst accident and chlamydia as our options. Um, so chlamydia can cause pelvic inflammatory disease. So the reason why I've gone for chlamydia over the ovarian cyst accident is the um, change to vaginal discharge and the fever. Okay, that's why I've gone with I've gone with chlamydia instead. So you could develop a PID from chlamydia, but it could also be an ovarian cyst accident. If, if I take out the discharge um, and take out the fever, then it could be an ovarian cyst accident from that same history. Okay. So. Now I've told you what the likely diagnosis is, then what treatment should she be commenced on? Okay, I'm just gonna reveal the answers shortly. I give a few more seconds. So those of you who chose doxycycline and metronidazole will be correct. OK, so it's a combination of things. So if you look, I, I don't know if you have access to the slides um, later, but I've put it on the slides. It's keftriaxone, um, doxycycline and metronidazole. So three of them together. Um, but doxycycline and metronidazole, at the very least, they'll be on it for 14 days. So two weeks. There are other regimens that she could go on. But those are the two most common. Um, these are the most common um, options. And then I'll just move. So the last one, just to emphasize one point. So which one of the following is not a complication of PID? Okay, I'll just show you the answer to this one. So the correct answer is multiple pregnancy. So the rest of them are potential uh, complications of PID. So pelvic inflammatory disease, especially things like chlamydia, gonorrhea, um, you can also get a pelvic inflammatory disease from a non-sexually transmitted organism. So the vagina has bugs, you could get a sending infection from the vagina 
into the uterus, into the, in the tubes and ovaries. So you can get um, a PID that is not sexually transmitted. But when you do get a, a PID, it does increase your risk of things like ectopic pregnancy, as we discussed earlier. But women can get chronic pelvic pain if it causes like scarring and adhesions in the pelvis. And, and also if the tubes are damaged, then it can cause subfertility as well or infertility. Uh, but it's not known to be associated with a multiple pregnancy. So that will be the, uh, the answer of what PID is not a complication of. So as a result, um, clinically, if we suspect PID, even if we don't have the swab results yet, it's better to empirically treat um, um, than to wait for the results because then you might be leaving more time for damage to be done. Okay, I think that's my last slide. So um, thank you very much for your time. Mm -hmm.